hello everyone and welcome to the second in the Compass Chamber series of uh, lunchtime webinars. Uh, today, Emma and I have been asked to discuss fatal accident inquiries and public inquiries in the COVID era, uh, what they might look like, what they could conclude and how they should be approached. And we thought it would be useful to look at them separately. And Emma, of course, is a very experienced uh, fatal accident inquiry practitioner having appeared in, I think, almost all of the most significant FAIs in recent years, for example, the Clutha, the Bin Lorry, and the Rose Park inquiries. And I think she's in the upcoming Sunbara uh, Fatal Accident Inquiry. In her spare time, of course, she edits the editor, or she's rather, she is the editor of the session cases. So Emma's going to talk about uh, Fatal Accident Inquiries first. And just to recap, um, Emma, the new inquiry regime came into place in the summer of 2017 and just by way of update and in a few sentences how did that change the landscape of FAIs that took place after that time? I think Mardo the biggest two changes that, that I would say emerge following the introduction of the new act are first of all the greater control and management powers that are given to the sheriff in navigating the whole progress of the inquiry. And the second change I would say is the creation of really fairly onerous um, requirements upon parties in the process uh, in terms of preparation. There's, there's now an onus on parties to identify issues at the earliest opportunity and so gone are the days that parties could simply turn up to a fatal accident inquiry and, and simply see how things played out. So in essence, there, there is now a duty under the new regime to essentially assist the inquiry to fulfil its remit to the full. And, and that's a duty that's it's very much regulated by the sheriff at every stage of the inquiry process. And, and in terms of that process and how FAIs might look um, in the in the new landscape. Um, in, in terms of how they're actually, the mechanics of them being conducted, do you think there is scope for that to be done remotely? Yes, is the short answer. And um, that is how the Sumbra inquiry is going to be conducted when it starts in a few weeks time. Um, the platform for that is Webex and practitioners might already have some familiarity with that um, over the past few months. Um, with, with Sumbra, the, the Scottish Court Service has been really very helpful in um, assisting parties with the technology. Um, I think so that when the inquiry starts, it will hopefully go as well as it possibly can. Um, Sumbra, in fact, won't in fact be the first virtual fatal accident inquiry. I understand there's an inquiry taking place this very week involving some of our colleagues. Um, and that's being conducted in the same way and certainly for the foreseeable future in the short to, to medium term I, I do think that um, more inquiries will need to be conducted in this way. And, and the fact that they might be carried out uh, remotely, to what extent do you think that impacts on the, the families of the deceased and their ability to, to properly engage with inquiries? Well, it's, it's vital, um, Murdo, for, for good reason that next of kin are always given the opportunity to participate in the inquiry process. And certainly a remote inquiry ought not to alter that. Um, with the Sumbra inquiry, the Crown have been very active in trying to ensure that families are able to participate as fully as possible, um, notwithstanding the, the remote nature of the inquiry. Um, by way of example, the Crown have arranged for live note transcripts to be prepared every day and made available to parties at the end of the day. And clearly those next of kin who have representation will be able to ask questions during the inquiry in one would hope much the usual way. And so I suppose as long as these things all work, then hopefully no party would be disadvantaged um, in the inquiry process, notwithstanding its, its remote nature doing it that way. My own personal view is that I think there's certainly at least a risk that something's lost in the process um, when, when inquiries are to be conducted in this way. Um, inquiries, they involve witnesses, expert witnesses, documentation, 
and obviously at the end of the day very important issues to be determined. Um, perhaps further down the line a solution could be found in order for these hearings to take place live and in, in the flesh so to speak. But meantime, however, I, I suppose the, the alternative to, to those ideas is simply that inquiries are delayed and uh, until such time as they could be held in a courtroom. And so a, a view might be taken, justice delayed is, is justice denied. So, so I suppose it's something of a balancing exercise, Murdo. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the, the potential subject matter of the inquiries, does there have to be a direct causative link established between uh, COVID and the deaths themselves before the sheriff goes on to consider the systemic failures, uh, either in a care home or a hospital, for example? No, if we're, if we're speaking about specifically COVID-related inquiries, then, then no, so long as any defect in, in any system of work could be shown as having contributed to a death, as long as there could be shown to be a, a causative element there, whether through COVID or not, then in terms of the legislation, the sheriff would be entitled to, to look at any such systemic failures and focus on them in his findings. And um, if, if he felt it necessary to, to make any recommendations, if he felt that were appropriate. And the recommendations that, that you mentioned there, um, have they got any bites? Do they have to be acted upon uh, by people that are subject to them? Well, any party who's made subject to a recommendation when the sheriff's determination is issued, whether that is an individual or an organisation, any party has um, eight weeks from the sheriff's determination to respond to that. And they have to set out how they are going to comply with that recommendation. And if they're not going to comply with it, to make that position clear and give the reasons as to why not. I would always recommend that in preparation for a fatal accident inquiry, if there is a feeling that your client might be in the receiving end of a recommendation, then taking any steps to, to remedy any gap in systems in advance of the inquiry is, is certainly a sensible approach because if any perceived feeling has already been remedied to satisfaction by the stage of your inquiry, then essentially you can save the sheriff the trouble of targeting your client with the recommendation. And it is a recommendation that, that does, as I say, carry with it a positive duty of response. Right, so are there any actual sanctions then compelling uh, parties to carry out the recommendations? It doesn't sound as if there are. There are no formal sanctions as such, right. no. Um, Lord Cullen, in fact, in his review into the FAI regime, he recommended that there ought to be, but his recommendation didn't, in fact, make its way into any legislation. So, no, there are no formal sanctions in, in the Act. There is, however, the, the prospect of adverse publicity and reputational damage to your client. If an individual or an organisation has received a, a recommendation, and if they have failed to do anything about that recommendation, and at the end of the day, these will be recommendations made by a sheriff in the course of an inquiry into something as serious as a death. Any failure to, to comply with a recommendation, it's, it's not going to reflect terribly well upon them. Yeah. And so it's not a formal sanction as such, but adverse publicity, I, I think, can certainly be minimised, if not avoided. And I would always, um, that, that would always be something I would advise a client to, to try and avoid where possible. All right, so, so getting to the, the nub of today's discussion, um, what do you think that these uh, FAIs, the COVID-related ones, will be looking at most closely? Well, I think, I think to answer that, it's helpful to have a look at what the Lord Advocate said to the Scottish Parliament in May of this year. And Lord Advocate said that the practice going forward for reporting deaths to Crown Office um, for COVID or presumed COVID deaths is that these deaths do not need to be reported to Crown Office unless there is some other substantive reason for doing that. And so the COVID deaths which do fall to be reported to Crown Office fall into two categories as per the Lord Advocate's direction. The first is those 
COVID deaths where the deceased might have contracted the virus in the course of their occupation or employment. And the second category is those COVID or presumed COVID deaths which occurred at the time when the deceased was a resident in a care home. And I understand a specialist unit is now established at Crown Office to take matters forward investigating these types of deaths. Now, plainly the Lord Advocate determines whether fatal accident inquiries are to be held or not, subject to the legislation. But I think it might be safe to assume that COVID deaths out with these categories will not result in any um, inquiry proceedings, given the view of the Lord Advocate on what requires to be reported. In terms of the inquiries themselves, issues I think would arise for, for any such inquiries, including whether deceased persons were needlessly exposed to risk, how that risk was managed, the treatment of patients, the treatment of residents in care homes, treatment of staff, and so really, I think a, a whole host of issues um, could possibly arise. All right, so um, of course, it's up to the, the Crown to get the ball rolling with regard to these uh, FAIs. But have you anything to say about how they should be approached? That's how FAIs should be approached from the perspective of uh, interested parties. Generally speaking, I would always say start with the inquiry rules. Um, they're a very good place to start, not least because they set out what's actually required of participants, which is plainly something you would want to know. The other aspect I would say is early identification of, of issues that you might have. That, that's key because the court will require these to be thought about at the earliest opportunity. And ultimately, you don't want your, your client to be left exposed further down the line. With that, I would say that early consultation with your client is, is essential, the earlier the better, uh, in order that these issues can, can be explored. Sure. Now, in terms of our um, terms of reference, I suppose, we were asked to consider what um, FAIs might conclude. Perhaps we should also ask when they might conclude now, there have been um, well-publicised criticisms, I think, of the Crown Office in terms of delays over the years. Are they still a problem, do you think? Yeah, I think, sadly, delay does seem endemic in the whole process, at least at the moment. Um, Sheriff Principal Turnbull last year in the Clutha inquiry, that took place some five and a half years after the accident. Sheriff Principal Turnbull expressed deep concern about the passage of time in bringing that inquiry before the court. Sheriff Principal Pyle has made comments much along the same line in the Sumber inquiry, and you'll recall Murdo, he, the Sheriff Principal Pyle um, made much the same comments um, in the, the, the earlier, the, the first Super Puma inquiry that, that you were instructed in in, in 2015. And so it's, it is a long standing issue. What, we do know is that Crown Office at the moment has and already had prior to the um, pandemic something of a backlog of reported deaths which will result in inquiries and these, these have yet to see the light of day but I think whilst there are so many COVID related deaths and so much uncertainty then perhaps a degree of delay is going to be inevitable with, with these types of cases Something which might make matters more expedient is the possibility of conjoined inquiries. Conjoining inquiries um, is specifically provided for by Section 13 of the Act. And in terms of any COVID related inquiries, not only do I think it would be realistic for conjoined inquiries into deaths to take place, I would have thought that would be likely if such fatal accident inquiries are to take place given the significant number of deaths, especially within care homes, and the inevitable commonality of issues which will arise. All right, well, thanks Emma for all those uh, insightful remarks. I should have said to ev everyone that if you have any comments to make or questions to ask, you can do those through the, the chat box that you should see on your screen. And if we have time, we'll try and answer some of those uh, at the end. Um, we're now moving on to, to public inquiries, so um, it's perhaps my time to take the hot seat. So, Emma, over to you. It is indeed, Murdo. 
Um, Murdo, I wanted to ask the about public inquiries. The first public inquiry that you were ever involved in was the, the Billy Wright inquiry in Northern Ireland. And I understand that took some five years and we've just been talking about delays in, in setting up fatal accident inquiries, but is five years an inordinately long time for, for any inquiry to take? A, well, it's a common complaint. Um, and the, the Savile inquiry, for example, uh, also known as the Bloody Sunday inquiry, took 12 years um, and was largely responsible for the 2005 Act coming into place. Uh, there were 152 firms of solicitors instructed, and of course the cost ran into the, the hundreds of millions. Um, and, but when one steps back for a moment and, and looks at other more recent inquiries, I, I would say something in the region of five to six years uh, in length is, as it were, par for the course. Um, so the Vale of Leaven inquiry, the Penrose inquiry, just looking at the Scottish ones alone, and even, even the, the trans inquiry where the, the report uh, will, will be out uh, uh, soon, that or those have all taken about the same length of time. And of course, it's all about context. Invariably, um, there is a huge amount of documentation, I think, in the trans inquiry, upwards of two million documents. And the time and effort taken to distill all those into uh, something manageable and relevant is, is considerable. So, but in short, um, it seems to me there have been no uh, unwarranted delays in any Scottish inquiries. And are there parallels to be drawn, would you say, between public inquiries and fatal accident inquiries? I think there are um, some uh, parallels, uh, but um, there are, they are still very different, um, certainly, when one looks at how they operate. The Inquiries Act allows the, the chair to determine um, his or her own rules. Uh, that arises most sharply in terms of uh, whether questions are allowed. There are three models there. First of all, no questions at all are being uh, allowed. And all, all questions have to be funneled through inquiry council. That happened in the Rosemary Nelson inquiry, also to a, a great extent, I think, in the Stockline inquiry. The, the, that practice was judicially reviewed unsuccessfully in the Nelson case. Then there's the, the second approach is the, the more conventional approach, which can result in a bit of a free-for-all. Um, we had that in the Billy Wright inquiry, where you would sometimes get six or seven cross-examinations of the one witness, which made it difficult to try and encapsulate what the, what the witness was uh, saying. And the third uh, model, which is, I think, uh, now pretty much the settled model, is to uh, allow some latitude. Um, they also differ importantly in, in respect of warning letters so that, that no party can be criticised in a public inquiry without being given uh, prior notice of that, known as a salmon uh, letter. But there are, as, as you've hinted at, uh, Emma, uh, similarities, certainly in terms of the tone of recent FAIs in particular, um, one or two that I've been involved in since the legislation changed. Um, there is much more direction from sheriffs in terms of, of looking at the issues that, that parties, of course, have to bring to the table and say what they think are important and, and in moulding the, the way the inquiry goes, but also in terms of uh, stopping uh, uh, needless or protracted cross-examination. Yep. Just bringing things back to, to Scotland, Murdo, can you tell us something about how inquiries under the 2005 Act have run in Scotland over the years. I know certainly that four have concluded, yep. two are yet to report or ongoing, which is the trans and the child abuse inquiry, yes. and two have very recently um, commenced being the hospitals and the yep. of bio death inquiry. What, what can you tell us about um, inquiries more generally in, in Scotland? Well, everyone will know in, in broad terms, as I, as I do, what what they're about. They're, they're quite diverse, uh, it seems to me, so it's, it's difficult to draw uh, conclusions as to as to trends there. Um, obviously some of them, in some cases there haven't been any deaths, such as the fingerprint inquiry or the trans inquiry, and in some, in some respects are uh, part of the, 
the hospital's uh, inquiry insofar as it, it relates to the, uh, the Edinburgh uh, part of it. Um, so there is, of course, a precedent for that, for looking at sort of infrastructure projects and, and uh, expenditure in, uh, in building matters such as the Fraser inquiry. But that is not to say there haven't been very significant public inquiries uh, about uh, public, legitimate public concern about, about, um, about deaths and, and failings, uh, in particular in the, the health sector, um, such as Penrose and Vale of Leven. And, and apart from occasional, very occasional um, allegations of whitewash, which are, seems to me are, are, are almost inevitable in, in many inquiries, Generally, I think the, the results of the Scottish uh, inquiries have been pretty well received. And how is a, a remit actually determined? The, the remit is up to the, the government. It's quite different, obviously, to, to FAIs. Um, and um, I think the interesting aspect there is that inquiries can um, essentially morph, as it were, into 2005 Act inquiries at the behest of the chair. So. For example, in the, the trans inquiry um, to enable the compulsion of witnesses, the provision of evidence and productions, um, Lord Hardy um, converted that to a 2005 Act inquiry, I think in late 2014. Similarly, in the Billy Wright inquiry, we were set up under the Prisons Act and we didn't feel we had enough powers to investigate the security at service and the like. So we changed to be to become a 2005 Act inquiry. The minister uh, is usually uh, quite happy. The relevant minister is, is happy to, to do that. So um, and, and I think despite initial reservations um, about the 2005 Act, it seems to me to be a pretty effective way to to try and get to the truth. Mm -hmm. And do you think there is scope for a public inquiry under the 2005 Act into aspects of the COVID pandemic? I do, uh, very much. And it, it's difficult to know where to start um, because it, it, it's hard to think of an aspect of Scottish society that hasn't been affected. Um, whether one looks at the economy, um, knock-on effects to education, principally the devastation to particular groups such as the, the elderly, um, ethnic minorities, frontline workers, and so on. And I think having given this a little thought, I think an inquiry would inevitably look at, at the government and um, how the government had planned for the crisis before the pandemic, uh, in light of earlier uh, epidemics, such as the swine flu and foot and mouth uh, outbreaks, but also uh, more, more uh, acutely, how the government has handled this crisis uh, as it unfolded. And there are several aspects of that that one can think of, uh, whether there was an undue delay in starting lockdown, um, the reliance on scientific evidence, and, and I suppose whether that scientific evidence was well-founded. The efficacy of the measures that were taken by the government, such as uh, track and trace, uh, the closing of schools, and prioritization, I suppose you might call that. Um, from a health and safety practitioner's perspective, the provision of PPE, especially to uh, frontline services uh, who seem to have taken um, uh, the brunt of, um, of the difficulties associated with this. Um, certainly one thinks of all the people that, that work uh, in the hospitals who are, are putting their, their lives at risk. Um, then one could look at the, the expenditure incurred in setting up these, these hospitals, the Nightingale hospitals, uh, the use of statistics, and one, one that I, I thought of as well that might, be, might merit consideration is, is how the, the message has been put out to the, the public. And it's one, one thinks of the, the Prime Minister's uh, press conference about whether people should go to work or not and in what circumstances. But apart from the government, I think obviously uh, NHS, the NHS and health boards will be looked at, the, the apparent clearing of wards and uh, to prioritise COVID. 19, perhaps that was a legitimate thing to do at the time. That may be uh, worthy of consideration. As you pointed out yourself, Emma, I think how it was handled in the private care home sector is, is uh, vitally uh, important, a big area of concern. And uh, as I've suggested, how it affected various groups, uh, the ethnic minorities, the elderly, uh, and so forth. And 
I suppose, fifthly, uh, the catastrophic effects on the economy, which uh, I suppose we have still to completely unravel. So those are the areas that I think would would be attractive uh, in terms of a public inquiries remit. Yeah, uh, fair to say, Murdo, that's, that's not a short list no, of no. potential issues and no doubt not exhaustive either. And we spoke about delay earlier on. I, I wonder how how could those all those issues possibly be analysed within a satisfactory time frame? Well, I suppose there's always going to be a tension between the desire for a swift inquiry uh, focused on the prevention of future deaths, particularly in the absence of a vaccination. On, on the other hand, one has to look at the, the government's handling of the crisis, as I say, and um, an important aspect as well in terms of inquiries is allowing the, the groups that have been adversely affected essentially to have their say, which is a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, aim. So um, that is really all on the other side, and, and there is a tension between these two things. So I, I think a staged inquiry is inevitable. We've had it with the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry um, and the Grenfell Inquiry, of course. So, uh, but it, it seems to me that it's of critical importance to learn the lessons as quickly as possible, as I say, uh, especially in the absence of a, of a vaccine. Yeah. Murdo, the, the First Minister has indicated that in due course, the Scottish Government's response to the virus outbreak will itself be subject to the scrutiny of a public inquiry. And I suppose it remains to be seen whether that would be as part of a UK-wide inquiry or as a standalone Scottish inquiry. Do you think there should or could be a, a Scottish standalone inquiry? Yeah, I, I think there should be. Uh, I think there could be as well. Um, on one view, the Scottish Government has not just blindly followed Westminster, uh, I think even on any view, but has developed its own strategy. So I suppose that has to be examined as well. Has it worked? Should it have gone further? Um, I think there's an appetite for a Scottish inquiry and there's no reason why it shouldn't happen. And of course, a particular feature of the 2005 Act is that um, the inquiries taking place in each country are only empowered to investigate matters that are wholly or primarily concerned with that country. So I think logically that means there would have to be uh, separate inquiries. Mm -hmm. I suppose just coming back to, to the idea of, of delay, do you think uh, an inquiry under the 2005 Act would be suitable to examine these issues or might uh, a parliamentary inquiry be, be quicker? Well, I think the, the issues are so wrapped up in, or many of them are so wrapped up in politics that it needs a, a wholly independent chair. And also the focus and resources um, that we've discussed already um, that can be brought to bear by a public inquiry are, are needed. Um, I think the public would expect it. And also parliamentary or privy council inquiries are not necessarily uh, a panacea. One, one thinks of the Chilcot inquiry, which took almost uh, almost seven years. That was about the uh, weapons of mass destruction and the cause of the Iraq War. So, um, I think the the way ahead is is almost certainly a, a public inquiry. And just lastly, Murdo, any advice to clients who might wonder whether or not they should be core participants in any inquiry? Well, I think firstly, as you said yourself, early uh, consultation is, is necessary and it just struck me as you were speaking, even to make sure that all the, the documents are marshaled, that preconditions are taken from people before they depart or um, uh, elsewhere. So um, I think that's important. But um, for public inquiries in particular, I think it's vitally important to uh, try to become a core participant because a core participant gains special rights including the right to disclosure of, of information, uh, the right to representation and to make legal submissions. Um, and also, as I said earlier, the, the right to, to suggest lines of questioning and um, finally to receive advance notice of the inquiry's report. So it's not really a time to hide in the long grass uh, until the inquiry is, is, is over. And speaking of which, uh, Emma, I see that we've uh, We've come up towards 30 uh, minutes or so, we so shall we see if there are 
Well, I think we possibly have time for one question, and there is one which I think is a question for you, Murdo. And okay. it is um, that in the context of public inquiries, at what stage would a warning letter be issued and by whom? Okay. That is from Victoria Anderson. Um, warning letters are, are issued at, on uh, at, at, essentially in, in two, at two stages in the inquiry. First of all, as I said earlier, certainly at the end of the inquiry, um, the, the letters are put out because it says in terms of the legislation that uh, the report cannot be published without these letters coming out. So that is at the end when the, I suppose, when the, the panel or the chair is considering what to write in the inquiry. But there is an earlier stage where letters uh, can be sent out and in my view should be sent out. This is a process called Maxwellization, which um, is named after Robert Maxwell, who objected to a particular inquiry. And they, they argued that they should have notice um, beforehand at an earlier stage of what the criticism might be so that they could prepare for it uh, during the hearings. And, and practice has varied with regard to whether such letters are, are, are put out. But uh, certainly at the end of the inquiry, there's another uh, question from uh, Susan Duff, um, also of Compass Chambers. Why is it called a salmon letter? That was named after uh, Baron Salmon, um, who S-A-L-M-O-N, not, not Salmon, but Salmon, who I think in 1966, um, when inquiries were being um, considered, there was consideration of a change at that stage, uh, he uh, thought that this would be the fairest way to, to proceed. So it's named after him. So I think uh, with that, um, it only remains for me to, to thank uh, Emma for your uh, input Thank you. To thank, uh, to thank all of you for tuning in. Next week, Steve Love and Elaine Russell will talk about liability and uh, working in a COVID-19 climate. So we will hopefully see you all there if you can get in. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.